ADHD Rewired, episode 424. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We have our monthly live Q&A today. We are recording this on March 8th. So I want to welcome all the people who are here. We have Moira Maben of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle Podcast. Hello. And I love the shirt. Currently adulting, it says. That is, that is great. I want one. And we have Will Curve of Hacking Your ADHD. What's going on, Will? Not much. Good to be here. Glad to have you here. And we have Brendan Mahan of ADHD Essentials. Hi, everybody. Hey, team. Thank you. <laughs> and we have MJ of ADHD Diversified. Howdy doody. All right. And that's who we have on the panel today. And in a little while, I think right after the break, we are going to have a special guest joining us. So if you're listening here on the podcast, you'll just have to stay tuned for that special guest. We have a question from Sarah. So Sarah, what is your question? Thanks, Eric. My question is, how do I keep my time blindness from derailing my teaching a 90-minute class that has a very tightly structured curriculum, a lot to cover? Do you have on your, uh, on that 90 minutes, each component and a designated amount of time for each, each section? I do. So I've gone through and, you know, it's timed minute by minute. And even though I develop some of this curriculum myself, there are other people involved. So it's, it's more collaborative than that. On Zoom, it was easier because I was able to have clocks and other cues. But now that we're back in the classroom, I just find I get really into some sections Uh and just spend a lot more time there than I had planned. Do you have a time timer? Not in the classroom. Okay. Can you get one? Probably. Yes. I, I know whenever I go give a presentation anywhere, I bring my 12 inch time timer with me and I put it in the back of the room so I can always see where I'm at. And so one of the things you might want to do is uh, if you have a way to mark the time timer to say, I need to be at this point, you know, when the, the timer hits at, at this section. You know, I know there are also different apps that you can customize, like how long a certain uh, timer is going. It's almost like a playlist timer. And if you uh, give me a second, I can find the name of that. And while I'm looking for that, I'm wondering if Moira or Brendan, who both have experience in the classroom, have any thoughts on this? I I mean, those two things, I sometimes use my Apple Watch because the haptics buzz me. And then actually, one of the things that I, I did is, um, I think we're pretty much all here. I know we've talked about Tamara Rosier's Uh, your brain's not broken. She does a really good piece about convergent and divergent thinking. And it made me realize when I go off track with instruction like that, it's because I'm being more divergent or I want to interact with the participants and having a trouble either like getting it back on track or someone who's talking going on and on like I would tend to do. So I'm wondering if there's other things like that, that you can maybe be curious about, about what's actually happening. Because literally, like I said to a group yesterday, oh, I need to be convergent right now. I'm starting to diverge. And then I also sometimes use sticky notes, right? And just like something that will get in my line of sight that will remind myself of the need to keep moving. Um, A couple other thoughts. One, I had a watch called the Timex Expedition. Don't know how I remembered that, but I did. (laughs) that had the easiest to set alarm ever. It was an analog clock watch 
and you'd spun a dial on the face of it that could set an alarm either to the hour or to the minute. And the one to the minute was super easy to set and was useful because I nice. always had something I needed to know about to stop. And I would set it a little before I had to worry about it. That watch might still be available, but if it is, huge credit to that watch. Sarah, do you do you have a uh, uh, Apple Watch by chance? I do have an Apple Watch. And I actually have tried just having it go in like five minute increments, mm-hmm. just sort of mark the time. The problem is that I haven't found an app for the Apple Watch anyway that will just do it every five minutes without me having to reset it. And I find then I miss one and then I get off. I got an idea for you on that. So if you create a, uh, cause you, you know, you have different watch faces that you can create the, what do they call them? The complications, which I think is really a funny name for it. But so I have, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to show it, even though this will not be good for the podcast, but for everyone who is here. So I have one of my, my watch faces, it has four different complications on it. And so I have it set for a five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute and 30 minutes. So I can literally take five seconds and set all four timers right at the beginning. And also the, the app that I was uh, looking for is called Task Player. It's uh, very similar to an old app that used to be very popular called 3030. Uh, does the same kind of functionality where you can customize a playlist timer, if that kind of makes sense. Last two things is depending on the grade you teach, you might be able to enlist students to help, right? Like depending on your relationship with your students and all that kind of stuff, that's complicated. The other thing though, is you mentioned that you helped create this curriculum. So it might be useful to revisit the curriculum and to talk to the other teachers that are executing the curriculum and see if there's areas in the curriculum that are just taking longer or taking less time for across the board, because you might need to make some adjustments. That's certainly conversations that we have. Um, Different people have different styles. This is actually for higher ed, which is, I think, part of when we talk about this idea of divergent versus convergent, because there are strategies I would be more likely to use if I was teaching younger students, but with older students, it, it does come into the, I feel like I should already have this figured out, right? And be able to be perfect with it. And so that's certainly part of the psychological challenge. Here's the thing, there's neurodiverse learners in your learning group. Yeah. And by you having the strength to speak about your experience and what works for you is gonna make it easier for other people to have different learning modalities. Yeah, that's, I like that, that, that thought. Yeah, these are really great ideas. Thank you so much. All right, let's uh, let's go to another question. And uh, and Sarah, check out the chat. I think some people were putting some other resources uh, in the chat as well. Um, on a waiting list for ADHD assessment and age 54, I finally got my appointment for March 17th. Congratulations. My emotions are all over the place. How do you cope with those feelings in the run-up to your assessment? Relatable. Say more, MJ. Um, Well, my thing going into it after I was kindly encouraged to go for an assessment was they're just going to tell me I'm stupid. They're just going to tell me that there's just something wrong with me. And that's, you know, part cultural, part societal, that I'm supposed to function a certain way and I don't adhere to the model minority stereotype. And it was really like I had to do a lot of reality checking with my partner who is also ADHD, like these are just things that ADHD folks do. And to me, I thought it was, I really had to fight with it. Like I'm not defective. ADHD is not a personality disorder. It's just an executive function thing. If you can find somebody to talk to about it that gets it or that has ADHD or just find the stories that you can relate to it, it does make it a bit easier. Um, yeah, just knowing that you're not alone. Yeah. Thanks, MJ. Anyone else want to add to that? I I was just reminded on a group that I'm on, a woman had to see three different practitioners. You know, one told her she was too smart to have ADHD. (laughs) One told her she was too old to have ADHD. And so having, and I've had this with psychiatrists. Both of which are are not true, by the way. Which are not true, yeah. yeah. Having people, having psychiatrists discount my experience that what I'm experiencing, that like basically writing it off and I guess just for that, it's having the strength and the awareness to trust in yourself and know that that's about them. It's not about you. And I hope you already know that this person is familiar with diagnosing women and women your age. Those would be two questions I would ask. 
Yeah, and and sadly, it's not just about that that doctor as a person. It's often about the doctor and how they were trained, because there are still medical schools. Five minutes, I think I've heard. Oh my! Like if that, I and I I still hear from uh, people who are in PhD programs who are saying that their professors will kind of dog ADHD, saying it's it's like the the diagnosis du jour, and it's like not real. So it, it, it still happens and it's, it's infuriating because it's, because ADHD, it is so manageable. It is really treatable. We don't have to like be on in the hard lane on the struggle bus to the max all the time. Right. So it, it's, I, it doesn't make sense to me, um, but it is what it is. So don't think that one doctor's assessment is the final say. So if, if you don't, you know, if what the doctor says doesn't make sense to you or doesn't feel right to you, um, seek a second opinion. Okay. All right. Do we, uh, we have Jesse who has uh, got a question for us. Jesse, go ahead. My question is, what are some of the signs that a job is really just not the right fit for you and it might be time to move on? I'm recently diagnosed. I work in a creative field. I freelanced, I bounced around a lot of jobs for a few years, finally landed a full-time job with good salary, good benefits. It's a real rarity in my industry to get that, but I am, I'm struggling. I am bored. (laughs) Um, I'm frustrated with the nine to five, a lot of the admin pieces, just having to work on stuff I'm not interested in and not having the choice that I had when I was freelancing. And now that I'm diagnosed, I'm trying some new approaches. Um, I'm trying medication, which has been a big help. But I'm wondering, you know, how do you tell the difference between that, like, grass is greener, ADHD restlessness versus I just, you know, really, this is not a good fit and it's time to find something new? This is a great question. Um, my, my first thought when you were asking this question was, well, if you're asking this question on a live Q&A, then maybe it's not the right fit. But as you're sort of talking about it, like, you know, there is no matter what the job is, there is absolutely going to be some aspects of our work that really feel like work, right? Or it's it's hard, it's boring. Now, the the thing that I I think is great that we strive for is trying to increase the amount of stuff we do that we love and decrease the amount of stuff that is just sort of outside our zone of genius. So I think that the more we can sort of be mindful uh, and intentional about the types of work that we do, but depending on sort of where you are in your career, it takes time to be able to to have that ratio of doing most of the stuff that you love doing fill your day, right? It's 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 hard to sort of jump into a career right at that point. You're you're new to medication, right? Yes. Okay. So you know, I think even looking at that, since you're new new to medication, new to that the diagnosis that kind of reset all your past experiences in a sense and look at all the things that you're finding boring through a new lens if you can through like all right what do i need to do or how can i make this easier or you know a question that i ask myself all the time is am i overcomplicating this right often the answer is yes um definitely so i think that the when we can sort of really keep asking ourselves questions around how we are processing our work that could be really helpful now, so you said you are working for someone else, is that right? Yeah, I'm working for a, a company. Okay. And you, you've done freelance stuff before, right? Yes. Um, essentially, you know, I, I kind of worked my way up from the freelance field mm-hmm. in a way into, a, you know, management full-time position. And that's kind of when I realized something was wrong <laughs> was when I kind of got away from the boots on the ground field work that I enjoyed And I'm now in a position where I'm kind of supervising other people doing that work. And I want to, you know, essentially demote myself back into the field where I would lose a lot of that stability, um, you know, financial benefits, but they're having all the fun. I'm getting frustrated watching other people do the fun work. Sure. And, you know, this is so common to have people who are good at their craft get promoted to management and which is a completely different skill set, right? So just because you're good at the craft doesn't mean you're going to be good at managing people. Like it's, it's just a completely different skill set. Um, what, what is, I'm curious to what everyone else's thoughts are on this. Did I take all of them already? It's, to some degree, it's a trade-off, <laughs> right? Like it's, you're trading stability for passion almost, it sounds like. 
And yeah, I'm exactly. Not, I feel like I have to choose between the stability or the creativity. And I'm, I've been a good manager. I'm getting good marks, but I don't like it. How long have you been a manager? I've been in this role for about three years now. The pandemic really, really upended things. I was about to quit one year into this job when the pandemic hit and everything kept changing. And I feel like it's just been like, let me get through the next year. You know, now I have a diagnosis medication. Let me get through the next year. And I'm just wondering, you know, when do I call it or can I make changes? Are you able to talk to the higher ups about maybe your job title can change? Maybe the things you're doing, like, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is there a way to split the hair in terms of like, I keep the stability, but get a little more of the passion. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying okay. to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Can you fill your passion bucket outside of work or your That's artistic what- bucket, whatever? How yeah, I'm trying to work on that too. I think a lot of it is by the end of the day, nine to five every day, I'm, I'm burned out. I'm tired. I don't want to be in front of a computer anymore. So I feel like, you know, my whole day is going toward this thing I don't want to do. And it's sucking all the energy out of, you know, what I want to do. What, what, so speak to what you do want to do. Um, well, I work in video production. So basically it's, it's, you know, working on, on videos that I'm, I'm passionate about, that I'm interested in, um, in styles that I like instead of just what I'm assigned to. And do you have sort of your, have have you thought of an ideal work environment for you? Like what, what that would look like? Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like I had that for a while when I was freelancing, there are just certain projects potentially working on sustainable or unstable nights, weekends. It's just, yeah, it's stability versus creativity. I'm just curious what your advice is on how do you make that choice? Well, and I heard you say something that I want to, um, I want to challenge. So you said that you will be making less. How could you do what you love making more? It's a great question. <laughs> right? Because I think there's an assumption there that you would make less based on the, your, your history of that. But that doesn't mean you can look at, at how, like what you're doing in a different way. Yeah. I think it feels like I'd be starting over again a little bit and having to overwork myself. And I'm hoping that now I have some skills and some new insights that'll keep me from going down that path again. Have you done much like learning about entrepreneurship? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I think if you know if you're if you're a an, an artist, if you're a creator, like you're in the business of whatever that craft is, right? And so being really uh, tr- trying to to kind of sharpen the saw around like what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? How do I how do I create systems to help me do more of the stuff that I like to do? How do I have a, a steady flow of of clients coming in? So there's not so much of you know, the, the dips aren't uh, as, as significant. So looking at through, through marketing. And I think that, you know, if you're doing video, then you probably are, you know, have some good tools for marketing. I'm imagining. I do marketing videos. <laughs> right. So you got to market yourself too, right? Apply, apply what people are hiring uh, you for, for yourself. Right. Cause I think that, that sometimes I, I hear people say that if they try to, they, the whole kind of self-employment thing and it, was, and it didn't work for them. It's like, well, that's a big broad stroke to sort of say that. And I think that, well, it's not for everyone. I think that for people with ADHD, it's a, it can be a really, really good option. Moira, and then we're going to take a quick break. I was just going to say, because Jesse mentioned you couple, you were mentioning a couple of times, like, how do you make a decision? Um, I put in the chat, um, it's called the four quadrant priority decision making or something like that, which is, it's, so you look at the drawbacks and benefits of doing or not doing a given thing. And the thing that I really like about this particular one is it actually gives a process once you've done that on how to evaluate what you've written down, if that's helpful at all. Okay, thank you. All right, we are going to take a quick break. So we will be right back. Support for this podcast comes from ADHD Rewired's coaching community, which includes our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, which you can learn more about at coachingrewired.com. Before this group, I thought I had to do everything. I think it mattered that I had a whole group of people who struggled with the same sorts of things. Before this group, it seemed like I just couldn't get anything done and I would do everything I could to avoid even the simplest tasks. And I learned that it's really good to offload stuff. It's really good to say no to stuff. To find so many like-minded people who understand the struggle and are on their own journeys to work through it has been so different from anything I've had before. But now instead of pushing myself, uh, instead of 
punishing myself and feeling guilty for how my brain works, I can believe and achieve and take pride in my successes and get excited for my future. If you are thinking about joining this group, I'd highly encourage it. There was something amazingly special about growing with a group of people who all had similar struggles as I did. Have you ever worked beside other people with ADHD who just get it? What would it be worth to you if you can gain more clarity on what you want out of your life? to better understand your ADHD and to make forward momentum on the things that matter most to you. In ADHD Rewireless Coaching and Accountability Groups, you will learn ways to become more aware of your time, plan your days, weeks, and months, and learn how to use your calendar to reflect your priorities and your goals so you can live a more meaningful and intentional life. The 28th season of ADHD Rewireless Coaching and Accountability Groups begin at 13. While spring has just started, our summer registration events will be here before you know it. If you want to join a coaching group built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD, then head on over to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our summer interest list. Even if you signed up on our interest list for a previous season, come on back to coachingrewired.com so you can stay in the loop for our summer registration events. That's coaching rewired.com Support for this podcast comes from Adult Study Hall by ADHD Rewired at adultstudyhall.com. Adult Study Hall is the judgment-free and shame-free co-working community for adults with ADHD just like you and me. There are plenty of ways you can optimize your productivity to get more done using real-time accountability. It's only $19.99 a month and it's free for the first week to try. So you can cancel your membership at any time. We have our themed and guided sessions, also known as Ash Plus or Adult Study Hall Plus, for writing, decluttering, working out, finances, and weekly check-ins. Then we have our session for making progress on art and other personal projects and a career-focused session led by our very own coach, Kat Hoyer. Then every month, I host our monthly Pomodoro dance party. Our next Ash Plus Pomodoro Dance Party is on Thursday, April 21st at 12 p.m. Central. That's April 21st at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. If you make it on time, we'll kick it off with a five-minute dance party warm-up. Then we'll work for two 50-minute work blocks with 10-minute dance breaks in between. Dancing is required if your environment and body allow, but dance skills are not necessary. If you want to join the virtual co-working community for adults with ADHD, we invite you to join us by going to adultstudyhall.com to get signed up. It's free for the first week, and then only $19.99 a month after that. Learn more about our Ash Plus sessions, our 24-7 drop-in room, and more by going to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. And we're back. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica, for that. All right, Jessica, what is your question? Well, I got a new job earlier this year, which is great, except in the pandemic, working from home, I cannot use many of the strategies that I found work really well for me, and I've been struggling. Like, I need external accountability. I need somebody to be like, hey, you're here at this time, so start working when you're supposed to, not, you know, whenever you feel like it. Any strategies, any input tips on how to make strategies that are not working anymore because of the pandemic work again? What kind of accountability have you tried? I actually have a very close group of friends from my old job. And for a while, we would work virtually together. And that helped, but that's kind of fizzled out. So our brains don't all work the same. Some of us, it it really helps. Others are like, no, I need complete silence from everybody. And I do, there's some co-working sessions that I have virtually um, with some other people, but that's, you know, that that's kind of hit or miss. And, you know, really, I think the biggest part is like, I started in the middle of the pandemic. I've never actually met any of my co-workers face to face. So I can't ask, like, I barely know them. So I don't want to be like, hey, who here wants to work virtually? Because everybody seems very like kind of focused on what they're doing and everybody's very busy and able to get things done. And I'm just kind of sitting over here by myself, like creating accountability via urgency. 
I found that's a trap that I've felt that I've fallen into. Jessica, are you making an assumption that your coworkers wouldn't enjoy some virtual coworking? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit. Okay. Um, obviously, I want to uh, mention adultstudyhall.com. That's like we launched it uh, last May for this very reason, because lots of people are still doing remote work and it's hard. It is hard to do remote work when you are basically responsible for managing your own time. Brendan, what are your thoughts? Not purely a repurposing strategies, but something that I keep encountering with people in the parenting groups, one-on-one clients, myself, friends. One of the things that gets lost when we work from home is transitions because you're not driving to work and you're not driving home. So those really obvious transitions that set boundaries for us go poof. And as a result, things get blurry and that makes everything harder. So it might make sense to come up with some transition rituals that you engage in to help you get into work mode and then out of work mode. And I highly recommend that part of that transitioning involves planning your day. Transitioning into work mode should look, could look like looking at your calendar, checking out your to-do list from the previous day, what am I doing today kind of stuff. And then transitioning out of work could be, what am I leaving uncompleted, incomplete that I need to address tomorrow? What do I know that is happening tomorrow that I can't even deal with until tomorrow? Those kinds of things. You can put stuff down and pick things up appropriately and recognize that transitions are more complicated than we think they are. I have a four element or a nine element component transition model that I play with. The first thing is for every transition, there's three stages. So there's transitioning out of whatever we're doing, then there's a gap, and then there's transitioning into the next thing. Then there's three elements to, the, to those three pieces, which is the physical transition, walking into the next room, taking out your binder, opening your laptop, whatever that might be, which is usually the only one we think about, but there's two more which is our cognitive transitions, right? We have to deal with our thought process and what we think about what's going on and what we think about what we're doing next. And then also the emotionality of it. We have to deal with that too. We have to transition out of the emotions of whatever we were just doing, then navigate that gap and then transition into the emotions of what's coming next. So I recognize I'm not repurposing a strategy here, but this is an important strategy for working from home more effectively. And it might open up some doors to the stuff you're already doing. Yeah, I definitely don't. In the mornings, it's a mad rush to get my kids out the door to school. And then sometimes like I literally just stand in the kitchen looking around me for like a full minute think wondering. Because you need to trans yeah, because you need to transition, but you're not doing it intentionally. Yes. Um Will. I just wanted to mention a different accountability service that I've been playing with recently called Shelpful that is just entirely text-based. And so what I'll do is I'll text my shelper what my to-do list is for the day with like the times I'm planning to do things. And they just text me back when I'm supposed to start those tasks. It's great as an accountability partner because I don't have any emotional investment with them. So if I don't do something, there's no like, I feel bad about it. It's like, oh, I just didn't get to that. And they're like, okay. I think that's so interesting, Will, because like when you said that, I was like, well, who the hell is this person? Like, I'm not emotionally invested with this person. That's not going to work for me. Like, because I, cause I think that having that relationship with someone is what makes accountability work, which is why I think services like Focusmate are kind of like, eh, because you don't really know these people. Like, I think you have to know, like, for accountability to really be effective, I think it's helpful to have a relationship with that person. But again, everyone is different. Yeah. I mean, there is like a, aspect of like my inner people pleaser wants to be like, Hey, I clicked everything I said I would do today. But there is also there's, I know I have had problems with accountability before where it's like, Oh, I didn't get to something. So now I don't want to talk to the person until I do the thing. And so I'm like not doing the thing and I'm just avoiding like texting someone back because I haven't done the thing. Oh, that's my life. I feel like that's every, (laughs) that's a lot of my time is spent doing that. More than anything, this has really gotten me back into the habit of writing out to-do list and planning my day because I, I ha- that's the easiest thing to do and just send to them even if I don't get to everything I plan to do. It's That's a good step in getting to what I need to do. Thanks, guys. All right. What is our next question? Uh, we have one from Greg. How can I keep doing the routines that keep my ADHD under control when I am traveling or in a different environment? Tell me the question again. I... I might not have been fully paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you have ADHD or something. Um, 
Uh, how can I keep doing the routines that keep my ADHD under control when I am traveling or in a different environment? Ooh. And I think of the like anchors. Um, Moyer, Moyer is a much more experienced traveler than probably any of us here, I think. So Moyer, what do you do to maintain your routines? I build, I build what I'm doing around that. Like, I, and I start to think about the transition ahead of time to think about the time zone change and what that will, how that will impact. And when am I going to get out and do physical activity? If I'm going to a conference, I actually like to stay not on site because then that gets me out of that environment. And it also gets me getting fresh air and moving. So sometimes engineering the things that you want. When I fly out of Seattle, there's a hotel that I stay at that I can walk to the airport. And then if there's things that are really important to you, finding travel versions of things. Like I have a travel yoga mat that is like super skinny, like creature comforts, take them with you. Because a lot of the issue sometimes is how do we pack when we don't know how we're going to feel? Because a lot of the times the things that we choose is based on how we're feeling. Yeah, I was also thinking about um, meetings, like meetings, reservations, anything that you have a commitment to somebody else to sort of get out of the door mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Getting the stuff that you need to, to leave your, the room like the night before can also be really helpful, kind of preparing all of that kind of stuff. Brendan? Some of the benefit of traveling is getting away from all of our routines. So don't discount that. Like you can put some of it down. There might be stuff like taking your medication that maybe you don't want to put down and you want to make sure that stays, but other things, maybe you can put it down. And I also want to expand this a little bit and say, make sure you have a plan for how you're going to get back into your routines when you return home. Especially uh, exercise, like really, like if, if that's currently part of your routine, I know for me, that's, that's something that I've, I've had to learn is that like, I have to like be really like extra intentional about um, exercise returning to a home from a trip that has been historically when I have uh, sort of slipped away from an exercise routine. So, so I really make sure that I, uh, I pick that back up when I get back. And also this stuff applies to any disruption in routine. It doesn't have to be traveling, right? Like I got nuked because my kids had a school vacation week a couple of weeks ago and that threw me off. And, and also Exercise is a good example here, right? One, one thing to think about is what is the thing that gets you to exercise, right? Like I've been relearning, oh no, I need music. Like that's, I exercise better when there's music. So I have to make sure I'm playing some music to get that rolling. And it also makes it easier to start the exercising and remember to do it. All right. I think we're going to take one more quick break. We will be right back. If you like ADHD Rewired, then be sure to check out all of the other shows we have on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. And for those of you who follow ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens, she just put out a new episode last week where she gets real talking about overcoming her limiting self-talk. Do yourself a favor and check this episode out. Then every second Tuesday of the month, you can join all of us for our monthly live Q&A. And if you are listening to this episode on the day it came out, that means our next live Q&A is today. That's today, April 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Join us today on Zoom by heading over to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register. If you enjoy this podcast and find value in the show, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast player that accepts reviews and subscribe so you don't miss any episodes that come out every week. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, when you share an episode with a friend who also uses Apple Podcasts, that episode will actually show up in their podcast app as an episode recommended by you. And I think that's pretty cool. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. Click on the podcast tab at the top to see our other podcasts. Click on the events tab to register for our live Q&A. All of it happens at ADHDrewired.com. And hey, thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from you. If you want to support this show because you love the podcast and the work that we are doing, then I would invite you to join our Patreon community. 
go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And I want to thank our newest patrons, Marianne C. and Laura R. for joining us on Patreon. Welcome to the community and we want to thank you again for your support. You can become a patron starting at any amount with perks starting at just $5 a month where you can get ad-free episodes of the show that come out a day or two early. Then at $25 a month, you can get a taste of group coaching by joining me for our monthly coaching call. Our next monthly coaching call is on Tuesday, April 26th at 3 p.m. Central. That's Tuesday, April 26th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Whether it's because of the ad-free episodes, our monthly coaching calls, or you simply want to support this podcast because you believe in the work that we are doing, your support is very much appreciated. Thank you to our patrons, old and new, for your support. And if you are considering supporting the show, I invite you to head on over to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. It only takes a minute to get yourself signed up there. Support can start at any amount. Perks start at just $5 a month. And really from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for supporting us. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. And we're back. He's like a pro, isn't it? Gibson! Thanks. All right. So I know we have at least one question here. And the question was from, uh, from Jessica. And uh, Jessica asked, my kids want me to play Roblox with them. Do you have a favorite game that we can play together? Um, depends what kind of games they like. Ooh. Okay. Say more. Um, if they like role-playing games where you can pretty much just explore and... B other things, then I recommend BFB 3D Roleplay. If if you're a tycoon guy, I am recommend Color Tycoon. If you're an adventure kind of guy like trying to find things, I recommend Find the Eggs. Um, and if you're looking for something a bit Minecrafty, try Islands. And what if the parent also has ADHD? Do you think that that matters? Eh, don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope those suggestions Wait. are helpful. Before you choose which game you should play in Roblox, learn how to play Roblox. Solid advice. All right, we have another question here. Yay. Where is this other question? I told a couple from the chat, too. Yeah. Somebody was also asking if, uh, Gibson, do you play pickleball with your dad? Oh, sometimes. I think oh, because I just, like, pinch myself on the headphone thing. You okay? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sometimes I like to play pickleball if the weather's nice. All right. All right, so other questions we have here. Um, what is your favorite thing about having a dad with ADHD and any words of advice for other parents on how to be the best parent with ADHD? A similar question that was any advice for my son about living with an ADHD parent? <laughs> um, so answer that, answer that last one. Any advice for a kid living with an, an ADHD parent? Well, I would advise the, pa- the, the parent to... Um, Okay, let's see. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I would advise... What was the question again? <laughs> He's one of us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry. Any advice about living with an ADHD parent? <laughs> advice for the parent or the kid? Advice for the son living with an ADHD parent. Oh, well... Listen, if, if you were talking to a, a friend and this friend said that my parent has ADHD and like there's maybe certain things that... Maybe they say, my my dad, he gets distracted by stuff or you know, what, what would you suggest for the kid yeah um i would sir i would really just suggest i would suggest forgiveness and maybe like ask your adult that has adhd if they can help out okay that's that's great thanks and, buddy and no it's not really a chore it's just called being nice ever heard of it <laughs> with with some snark okay do we have uh can you maybe do one more quick question for gibson and then we will uh oh here we go um do you like to cook or make food not that much really he just likes to eat it yeah so let me ask you this what do you think is the coolest thing for you about having adhd the coolest the best part about me having adhd mm-hmm. my dad i mean because <laughs> He literally hopes a podcast on ADHD, and he's an entrepreneur. I look up to him. Aw. 
I'm having a very proud dad moment right now. Thanks, buddy. You're All right. Welcome. You can uh, go back to what you were doing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let me say thanks. Thanks for having me. And dad. Yeah. I'll be back. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. What is our next question? A question from Abby. Got diagnosis last year at 41. I've been having issues with my neurotypical spouse. Now that some of my traits that annoy them are symptoms of my ADHD, like rambling, interrupting, and forgetting. I try my best, but I can't always control everything, especially at the end of a workday when I don't have much energy left to manage my symptoms. What are some ways we can work on communication so that we don't end up in unnecessary conflicts? I feel like we have a lot lost in translation between our different brain styles, different style brains. Brendan, what are your thoughts on this one? Um, some of the, it sounds like if I'm reading this correctly, their spouse, the traits they already had became annoying after the diagnosis. In my, I don't know if I'm understanding that correctly, which is in my experience, it's usually the other way around where like stuff that was annoying becomes less annoying because now we have a reason for it. But one critical piece of communication is it's not always helpful. It's almost never helpful to talk about the conflict when you're in the conflict, right? Like wait until we're all de-escalated and then revisit that topic and have a conversation about it and things might re-escalate that's possible but if we can talk about what the challenge was when we're a little calmer we might be able to come up with strategies and tactics to to address it more effectively another thing that's important to point out is there's an asymmetricalness to communication right if if I go to talk to my wife, <laughs> who am I kidding? If my wife comes to talk to me about something that she's concerned about that I'm doing wrong, right? Because I'm the ADHD person. When she comes to me, it's easy for me to get overwhelmed because she has all this information and has done all this thinking about whatever it is that she wants to talk about. And I'm starting it kind of zero, right? So if, if you're finding that's a challenge that you're experiencing on either side, I just send an email, like whoever's, my wife used, this has fundamentally kept our marriage together. My wife just started sending me emails about the big, hard conversation so that I knew what she was thinking. And then I could come to that conversation more prepared and more balanced instead of feeling like I was put on the spot and overwhelmed. To add on to Brendan's communication strategies, doing the, like that kind of communication over text can also be very helpful because I have that same thing where I get overwhelmed. I have trouble processing what I'm hearing and, and I can't talk. And so it just comes off as me being moody and silent, whereas I'm just sitting there really trying to process. And if I just have a little bit of space and I can just be like, these are my thoughts, I can lay them out. I can like slow down and organize my thoughts and then send them rather than trying to do it all at once in a conversation. And at first I'm like, this feels awful. I am trying to avoid my emotions, but it's like, oh no, this is actually just how, what works for my brain. And it's not about you. It's about my ears having problems. <laughs> Another piece to this is pay attention to stonewalling, mm. right? Which is when one of the people in the conversation is not giving the usual nonverbal cues that they're listening because that is going to lead to conflict because the other person, especially if it's, if the other person is concerned about connection and feeling connected, stonewalling is going to make them feel disconnected. And then they're either going to disconnect themselves or chase to try to get that connection back. And if they chase the stonewaller is going to retreat that much more. And now we're off to the races either because we're both stonewalling or because we're chasing back and forth and escalating in that regard. So that that's a thing to pay attention to. A lot, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about specifically is really related to anxiety management. And then communication is how it's not being managed as well as it might be. Sort of related to what Brendan was saying about not dealing with it in the moment, but added on to that is maybe suggesting like, and also with the, the time to think about things, because I always find it fascinating when I hear about like, you know, Brendan saying I'm the one with ADHD because still being a woman and having ADHD, some of those dynamics are still the same, even though my partner doesn't have ADHD. So I will have thought about things and he hasn't. So asking for people to, or the, whoever you're having the issue with, to take some time to think about that interaction and say, you know, I want to come back to it. And where he's really good is the remembering to come back to it. And then finding a time and it really helps i think often to be far enough away from that event because these things happen on repeat but if you can get far enough away from events so you don't have that emotional reactivity to it that some of us can be prone to have it can make it easier to have sort of that analytical discussion of 
well, this is what I was intending. How did it come across to you? And, and if they're willing to have engage in that kind of problem solving of assuming people have good intents and then where our miscommunication, our misactions were misinterpreted. I would also, I think I've recommended this book before on the podcast, but uh, Crucial Conversations, really, really helpful book. One of the, the main things I talk about in this, this book is sort of getting out of the content of a conversation when the, the conversation starts to kind of go awry right? And focus on how the conversation is actually occurring. All right. Do we have one last question? I know we have a lot of questions that we didn't answer, but we have time for one more. Would love to hear any tips for improving memory, particularly recall when put on the spot. This person is in grad school and is really struggling with this, particularly in stressful moments. Mine goes blank. <laughs> um, well, my first thought on this, you said you were a grad student. How's your sleep? Because if your sleep is not good, if your sleep looks anything like mine did during grad school, um, if I can go back in time, I would rather have gotten worse grades because like I got a 4.0 in grad school at the cost of sleeping an average of two hours a night, like not worth it. It's so unhealthy. So if you're not sleeping well, your memory, that, that specifically that working memory and even your ability to, to recall stuff, it's kind of, it gets locked in the brain. Brendan? Also, you're allowed to name it and claim it depending on the situation. This does not work on a test. But if your teacher is like, what's this thing? And your mind goes blank. You're allowed to say, oh, give me a second. My mind just went blank. And then like try to figure it out. Because sometimes doing that, it can de-escalate you and, and in the short term. But in the long term, it can get you more comfortable with those kinds of moments and with your mind going blank. And that will de-escalate you in the long term, which means your mind is going to go blank less often because your anxiety is not going to spike because a, a decent amount of this is just the anxiety being put in the spot. So any, any strategy that's going to help you manage your anxiety in the big picture will also help here because you'll be further away from the amygdala when your anxiety increases. And a, uh, a good book for just helping you remember things, uh, make it stick the science of learning for any, anyone who's in higher ed, I would highly, highly recommend by uh, Peter Brown. All right. I think that is all the time that we have for today. Will, do you have a moment of that for us? Well, I was just thinking about the constant struggle of in my life between wanting buns of steel versus wanting buns of cinnamon. <laughs> it took this weird turn there at the very last second. That was okay. Do you not like buns of cinnamon? I'm, I'm going to have to chew on that one a little bit. I usually choose the buns of cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just speechless. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. We, will, we do this every single month on the second Tuesday of the month at the same time. So thank you, everyone, for your questions. If you were not able to, uh, if we didn't get your questions answered, please come back next month. We do our best to try to answer as many questions as we can. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful month, and we'll see all of you back here next month. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn. 
at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.